Okay, thanks for joining us for our bonus episode where we're gonna answer some at-home participant questions that we didn't have time to get to. So the first one is, uh, who is the angel of the Lord? And the person went on to say, I have been looking up Christophany versus Theophany. So I don't know, these are big words. I didn't know what they meant, so I had to look them up. Um, and she just went on to say, uh, I'm a little confused. So this is what I found, and you'd be proud of me. Even check the Walls website in their q and I am proud of you for that, yes. There was no Q&A, so they had no information. But oh. <laughs> well, take it back then. So Christophany, just I think you can correct me if I'm wrong, is a word that means the appearance of Christ, like a pre-incarnate Christ before his time on earth. And then theophany would be an appearance of God to a person in a tangible way. So in, in, examples that they gave... For theophany would be like the burning bush that appeared to Moses or the pillar of cloud and fire um, leading the Israelites out of Egypt. Um, Ezekiel seeing God in his chariot. And they also use the example of the two angels that we just talked about coming to Abram and Lot. They said that was two angels with God. And that one I was confused on because I don't know why that would be God versus Jesus. So uh, Christophany would be the appearance of Christ, like I said. And the examples they used for that were, like we already talked about, Melchizedek. Um, in Joshua, it talks about the commander of the army of the Lord. And I actually have that one. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you friend or foe? Neither one, he replied, I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this time, Joshua fell to his face, fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command. He said, what do you want your servant to do? So they were using that as an example of the pre-incarnate Christ. And, but there were a few I was kind of confused on. So, for example, why would that be God versus Jesus talking with Abram and Lot? And also, an example they used for Christophany. So the pre-incarnate Christ was actually the person walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. They said because it's very clear that Jesus had a hand in uh, the creation that that was more likely to be him. And then it said some Bible commentators will say any mention of angel of the Lord is um, is the pre-incarnate Christ. So mm -hmm. they didn't really seem to distinguish. So thoughts. Yeah. The, so the simple meaning of it would be uh, like an epiphany is like a an awareness of something that is now made is now shown to you. Um, so um, the phany, like theophany, is the appearance of God. Christophany would be the appearance of Christ or the second person of the Trinity. The short, the shorter answer to it is like we don't know and mm -hmm. that, that's not the sum total of what we can say but anybody who is a little too confident that they know exactly what is who is who, who, is who and when like this is the second person of the trinity not the first person of the trinity here uh like it just like a lot of really good bible scholars have debated some of these for a long time Are there... do, do we know that god makes appearances in the old testament very clearly mm -hmm. do we suspect that uh very clearly they are, they are also the second person of the trinity at times can what, we pinpoint all the exact so times do, do you have no. like any examples where okay this is very clear this would be the pre-incarnate christ the examples that were given that you just read what off about... are generally the ones that are oh in the garden that one uh i haven't heard as often as a christophany the like so in in john chapter one in the beginning was the word and the mm -hmm. word was with god and the word was god he was with god in the beginning mm -hmm. uh it talks about elsewhere in the new testament it talks about all things are created through him so we know that mm -hmm. even though i think simplistically we oftentimes just think of the father as like oh that's the creator mm -hmm. um in fact i i'm I could be wrong. I think that uh, even in my, my catechism growing up, I think in parentheses, they had put like uh, father, on the yes. first person of the Trinity, creator. Making statements. And, and I just, you know, the, the more I look at it, I'm like, well, d separating the work of the three persons of the Trinity is sometimes very difficult. In fact, about the only thing that I can say, yes, I know for sure that this is this person of the Trinity mm -hmm. is Jesus dying on the cross. Oh. And like, so you won't, you wouldn't say the spirit well, died the on the cross and you wouldn't Christ, say though. the father died on the cross. So when you're that's talking the, about pre-incarnate Christ, it gets that the much. Incarnate. That's the incarnate. No, my point though is separating, even once he's incarnate, 
separating the work of the Trinity becomes yeah, ch it's challenging. True. So when you're talking about pre-incarnate, mm -hmm. uh, separating the work of the Trinity is uh, Oh, I never thought difficult. about that. It might not be one or the other. It's somehow both. Here's here's the thing. I, I think it probably is this. There is a distinction here. Okay. I don't know that we can fully answer what that distinction is. What about is. in the lion's den? That's one I've always heard as this was the Jesus, Christ. the pre incarnate yeah. Christ. Yeah, uh, in part because it says, look, there is one like the Son of Man oh, who's in there. Oh, that's very clear. And, uh, that's what Jesus called himself. So, and that's a phrase that's used um, in Daniel to talk about the coming Messiah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. again, can we, like, totally prove that? No. Does it move the needle in as far as, like, salvation? I think no. Uh, we know, like, even without knowing about a specific Christophany, you know, like you should know from Scripture in general that the second person of the Trinity is active and mm -hmm. open. I mean, he's, we're told... Uh, in, in John that he's active in the creation work. So he's active in all of the Old Testament history up until the time he becomes incarnate, mm -hmm. which are the specific first person of the Trinity versus second person of the Trinity is difficult to, to nail mm -hmm. down. All right. So the second one, um, we talked about how Abram won't deal with Hagar and won't take step up and take leadership or responsibility in that way. And Sarah steps in, which leads to... Um, like a breaking of a relationship and it's just ultimately the point was when men won't take a spiritual leadership role and women try to usurp that role it doesn't usually end well so the question was how do we reconcile that with Deborah and Judges 4 there appeared to be no male leaders and she steps in and there are good consequences was that an appropriate action mm -hmm. yeah so Deborah is a prophetess which also is maybe blows some minds if you have a very like um hyper conservative perception of gender mm -hmm. roles like that we have prophetesses uh mm -hmm. plural both old testament new testament um the doesn't it tell you something that the women were the ones at the tomb and like the women were the ones going and preaching essentially telling everyone jesus is alive no, uh, that doesn't, the, the fact that they were, but why were they at the tomb? They weren't there because they were confident he was rising from the grave. They were there because they were no, finishing the No, but they the got to be process. the ones to go and proclaim that to everyone. It, it, it says, men and women. what it does say is that God has no special favor upon men, that the first person he reveals himself to yeah. in the resurrection, it doesn't tell us, it does not, it tells us that men and women are equal in that regard. It doesn't mm -hmm. tell us that women are better in that regard well, i didn't say better but they're clearly qualified yeah no i i think to tell what they've seen yeah whether or not the world thought they were qualified again what the world thinks about it is is mm -hmm. irrelevant to god and i think that's part of what we learned from it too uh the situation so it's not always wrong for a woman to move into a position of leadership if there isn't adequate leadership there uh i think the times when we see like so for instance so i think we need to the Adam Make and Eve. Sure, we're speaking like you're saying spiritually. Yeah, primarily, yeah. So, it. I mean, it wouldn't be wrong for a woman to take a leadership position, regardless if there wasn't a uh, capable man in like a business sense. Yeah, that's to me. That's a slightly different conversation, and I mean, the short answer to that, I would say, is no. The the parameters that God sets. Mm -hmm. Although I'm really the reason I'm hesitant to say that is when people departmentalize what is spiritual versus what isn't. Mm -hmm. I get a little uncomfortable because mm -hmm. the spiritual is an overarching principle mm -hmm. of of all of humanity. Like if you're a Christian, you're a Christian all the time, not just here or there. Mm -hmm. Um, but the, the world is not, um, the church mm -hmm. and therefore the principles that we act in right. outside of the Christian realm is are a little bit different. Oh. Um, so, uh, what I would say here, so back to Kyle's question specifically mm -hmm. about like Deborah, for instance, Jack, yeah. uh, Jack's question about Deborah. So the situation with Deborah, like she actually goes out of her way to say that this is uh, kind of humiliating for the nation of Israel, mm. that she's in charge. So she's a prophetess. She's also serving as she is. People are being brought to her to serve as a judge. She encourages one of the commanders to go and take um, Sisera as the, the, the Canaanite uh, general at the time to, to mm -hmm. defeat them. And he, he like hesitates. And she says, this is just, uh, she's like, this is just calling it out. This mm -hmm. is another example of how Israel is totally like 
stripped at this point of faithful male leaders. Mm -hmm. And she's like, it's actually, um, she says, the, the people will say that honor, the honor will not be yours, Barak, because the Lord is handing Sisera, this evil Canaanite general, over to a woman. Mm -hmm. And she's saying that is, even though we're going to win this battle, there's still a little bit of um, humiliation. Mm -hmm. Not because it's a woman who's leading and in, in winning, but because there are no qualified men. Mm -hmm. Like that was God's design. And there just, there are not any men who are acting out of faith mm -hmm. here. And that's the humiliation. It's not that a woman, it's not that there's something wrong with a woman. It's yeah. that there's clearly lots of things wrong with the men. So in this situation, it was appropriate because she is clearly recognizing this isn't the way it should be, but this is the way God's going to allow it to be right now. Yeah. I, I also think, so remember as a prophetess, mm -hmm. we very clearly get the understanding that this is a woman who has been called by God. Yeah. So she's not... If God is, well, our understanding is God has asked her to do this mm -hmm, right? and made it clear. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, this one goes back to Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. In verse 6, God says, God looks down and says, they all speak the same language. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And the questioner was just saying, I don't really, what is God actually saying? Because obviously we are, we have limitations as humans. Mm -hmm. So what does he mean when he says nothing would be impossible for them? Yeah. Like, could they actually build a tower to the heavens? Yeah. So the, it makes me think a little bit of what Jesus, so Jesus uses hyperbole and the apostle Paul uses hyperbole all the time. Mm -hmm. In ancient Semitic writing, it was, com there is a, there is a device called just Semitic hyperbole, mm. which is an overstatement of something for, to make, to establish your point very clearly. Mm -hmm. Um, so when Jesus talks, for instance, about people who are following him and he says, uh, you know, the dead shall bury their dead. Mm -hmm. It seems to be like lack of compassion for your family members. Or, um, when people ask him like, oh, your, your mother and your brothers are here. And he says, no, those who trust in my father, they are my family. Mm -hmm. He's not being disrespectful to his family. He's using shocking hyperbole, Semitic hyperbole for provocative yeah. reasons. Mm -hmm. So the Lord is not saying humans are going to like do anything in the sense of like the things that God himself can do. Mm -hmm. uh, humans are not going to start, you know, flapping their wings and flying, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I'm trying to think of a, a, a stupid example that is again, hyperbole, like the things that like, we're not going to be able to become Superman kind of mm -hmm. thing. The flip side of this, however, is, um, so in other words, humans do have limitations. The flip side of it though, is the, the limitations for humans aren't nearly as, they're not as limited as what we think they are right now. Mm -hmm. So there's a great, uh, a quote that I've used a number of times by Arthur C. Clarke, who is a British, um, science fiction writer in the 20th century. And his, it goes something like, I always get a little bit wrong, but it's something like any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Mm. Any sufficiently advanced technology yeah. is indistinguishable. I don't know how the internet works. So, like, yeah, a hundred years ago, if you would have showed people what we're doing, like what we're doing right now, uh, via you know some microphones and a phone and the internet and stuff like that, they would say that's some kind of magic, you know, mm -hmm. that's like, or is that you know the the angels and demons kind of thing? Well, it's sufficiently advanced technology and it's indiscernible from magic. And the, the point is, humans are capable of incredible things mm -hmm. because by God's design they're capable of incredible things they're lower than God well how do you take someone's organ and put it into someone else and it functions right you know like that was unthinkable um yeah any modern medicine mm -hmm. I think falls in that category the point is we're we're always lower than God mm -hmm. and God is not suggesting they're capable of becoming exactly yeah. like me in that way but we're always capable of more than what we immediately think right now. So the answer is God's being sarcastic. Uh, I would use the term Semitic hyperbole. <laughs> but, so I don't think sar sarcasm. I don't think he's like mocking them. I think he's saying like, oh, they're, they're capable of a lot. And they're because the issue with the people of Babel is they're, they're proud. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so if I just continue, they're going to continue advancing. They've already advanced quite a bit. They're only going to get more proud. And mm -hmm. what they spiritually need is to become humbled at this point. Yeah. So he's like, I'm not going to let them continue to go on like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Fourth question. Um, in one of the chapters we talked about, oh, oh yeah. Because I thought it was a little strange that Abram 
blessed Melchizedek and I said well if it was it actually was God or one of the persons in the Trinity is that strange to say like you would bless God and then you brought out the example well we sing that song bless the Lord oh my soul yep. and um, that a blessing our understanding of the term is maybe not appropriate so maybe you could just expound on that it's like yeah. what does it mean so modern English people English speaking people have come to interpret bless simply as like good things that you receive from God. Mm -hmm. That's not what, so the, the Hebrew word barach uh, means to bless. And basically what it, what it literally means is to speak words invoking divine favor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so essentially when we say like, so a good example of this in the Bible would be Psalm 103, both at the beginning, it ends, begins and ends uh, the Psalm with the, the statement, bless the Lord, O my soul. And essentially means speak well of uh, the greatness of something mm -hmm. and invoke uh, divine goodness upon something. And so, um, in other words, God can bless us by his own power and by his own authority. He can speak well of us in a way that brings goodness to us. Mm -hmm. That's how we've come to understand blessing. Not so much of him. Yeah. We, we think blessing is just like, oh, I got good stuff. When in reality... Hashtag blessed. There it is. And, but in reality, what the blessing part of it is actually God speaking favor mm -hmm. over us. And we receive bless we receive good things as a result of that. But the blessing is actually God speaking and his words of divine goodness to us. Mm -hmm. um, that translates into sometimes like material and, and health good things and stuff like that. It's also possible that anyone can speak blessing upon another, another human being. It's part of the reason that... Um, uh, you know, people, I think, uh, people who are not familiar with like liturgical worship will find like the blessing at the end of the service mm -hmm. and they actually see it as almost kind of inappropriate. Like, who are you, for instance, as a pastor mm -hmm. to speak blessing upon the rest of us? Well, it's, it's not that I'm generating a blessing. I am asking God to, to, uh, speak favorably towards you. Mm -hmm. Use these words as, um, equivalent to your words to bring goodness into the life of somebody else. So with that understanding, to speak well, uh, that it brings goodness for someone else, it's entirely possible that a human can speak well of God and glorify his name and lift up his name and bring goodness to his name. Mm -hmm. uh, again, the reason people misunderstand it, and I, I double-checked a couple translations uh, on this, and a lot of English translations have changed what that, that Hebrew word barak when humans are speaking it to say praise, not bless. Um, because they know that most English speaking people have trouble reconciling the idea of a human blessing God. Don't